speaking with Nate Powell. He's known for the March Trilogy, of course. And we're going to be talking about Save It for Later, which is his new book. And uh, first off, uh, thank you so much for doing this, Nate. Of course, glad to be here. I wanted to begin by uh, asking you about uh, your process, because I was looking at a video of uh, you describing it, giving a window of how you do things. And uh, it seems to me, typically, normally, it might be more like a Marvel method, like you give yourself your own Stanley uh, Marvel method, you, you draw it out first, and then you you bring it bring in the story and you don't do thumbnails or a script necessarily but is it maybe different in this case where there were a lot more notes involved as as you were creating this book uh yeah it depends so yeah so save it for later it's it's seven interconnected essays and, and memoir chapters and so each each chapter was basically completed on its own, but from the outset, all of the first person memoir chapters that were more subjective and required a little less homework, uh, they were pretty much worked up very quickly in succession, I'd say in spring 2018. Um, and originally, uh, that was its own kind of slim 96 page book. Uh, and I was really fired up about um, what I considered to be, you know, the like the mandate of the book to kind of clear space just a year into uh, this authoritarian regime where you have a hundred fires burning at once and, and things are happening so fast that I could already sense um, the urge to, sh to push down uh, some of the more personal responses and to share emotional responses uh, because there was so much we needed to put energy into, and there still is. Um, so I wanted to make a quick, raw, personal uh, book that sort of stood on its own. And my, my goal was actually to do that in like six months. Uh, at the same time, I was starting to crystallize and collect all these observations and these bigger ideas for uh, the comics essay that became About Face. Uh, which was originally a separate project from its eventual inclusion in Save It For Later. Uh, and it comes from a more, I mean, it's definitely my voice and I'm putting my observations, and my takes together, but it, uh, it is an essay. And so it's, it leans more towards an objective removed form of storytelling. Um, so yeah, for each one of these chapters, and there are smaller, more personal things that I did for the nib um, that required very little homework. So yeah, for each chapter, it goes from the big idea into basically just taking my sketchbook and laying out, you know, four to 10 pages of thumbnails in one blast and kind of scribbling, scribbling in text um, into my sketchbook. Uh, and then working out the fine tunings of the script at the pencil stage, which is what I typically do whenever I'm doing, you know, fiction graphic novels. Yeah, it is like a, a one person Marvel method. Uh, I have a, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to get away from the, the method that, that you feel most naturally inclined to do because no one's behind, no one's looking over your shoulder. You're going to do what you need to do. And that's what I do with my interviews. I've got so many notes here that it, it drives me crazy where to begin, which, which uh, line of attack should I do? But uh, one thing that comes to mind uh, is about, about face. Let's talk about that a little bit. You talk about the paramilitary logos and, and all of that stuff and the coded language that goes on. Um, and then you think, about, I, I think about the, the the storming of the Capitol, all of that. But when you can, when you get right down to it, you think of somebody like the, the shaman with that big hat of his, he completely disavowed what he was doing. A lot of these bullies, they'll just fall like a house of cards. What, what do you think? What do you think about that? What comes to mind? Uh, well, I mean, what, what comes to mind is that these are like, these are actions which have increased and will continue to increase in intensity and consequence in, in intensity and severity without appropriate consequences. You know, 
like a lot of people are fine getting caught uh breaking the law in service of corrupt power or whatever it's a matter of consequences and so i don't think anything of, of QAnon shaman guy's disavowal of his actions because I don't believe it. Of course, he's going to disavow his actions. This is like the white person's legal go-to is to go through the motions of disavowing and regretting any harm they may have caused and not knowing the severity of what they've gotten caught into. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing that has just a long history of lack of accountability. Uh, and so the more, the more that line of argument stays, you know, the more it's repeated, the more it's normalized, the more it functions as a kind of plausible deniability for future actions. And in the case of about face, which is mostly talking about shifts in style and aesthetic and symbols um, through pop culture, but filtered from military and paramilitary uh, presence, uh, the entire reason why the, the prevalence of, of these symbols are alarming is because their sort of apolitical existence outside of white supremacists and paramilitary units, the, uh, their, the broadness of their presence throughout pop culture uh, in the last five you know, to 10 years is that plausible deniability. So like the, the major focus of about face is simply that in order for these symbols to function in normalizing a fascist or paramilitary presence, it requires the symbols themselves, uh, you know, doing the work of, of making their own kind of counter argument like, oh, well, these can't possibly be directly tied to these more dangerous units because they are everywhere. You can't just lump everyone into a, into one pile, which is true, but, but this is what opens the door into plausible deniability. So in About Face, I'm really trying to focus on the evolution of the symbols themselves in the context of military, paramilitary, and law enforcement into just consumer culture. It's a, a slippery, crazy slope, lots of distraction, of course, uh, and it's it's interesting to try to avoid saying that the, the name Trump, but uh, Trump is a, a, a master, or or the people who help him along are, are masters of manipulating all this. And you can use terms like "stand by," "stand down," boys. And the, a lot the, a lot of the journalists don't know what to make of that, or there's no call no, no calling out of of that of that kind of uh, bullshit. Yeah, but and I mean, a lot of it is, I mean, he's a master manipulator too. And a lot of it is, you know, he's a, me a master media manipulator. He's highly skilled, but specifically in knowing the weaknesses of uh, media and of dissemination of, of information. It's the, you know, the fact that still mainstream media has not learned its lesson, like to resist the urge to do things for ratings, for access, for clicks, for exposure. Um, and this is where we get into very the very dangerous complicity and, and a number of very difficult issues with covering these, these serious pushes for authoritarian power grabs. Um, yeah. Now, this is kind of like a rhetorical question because the, the answer seems obvious, but uh, and I, I, I try to to wax uh, poetic about this in my review, I, I attempt to talking about how we live in a pocket of time and we, we do the best we can during our time here on earth. What can we do? We, every generation wants to answer the, the wrongs of the past one way or another. What do you suggest? Because we need to live with each other and uh, we all that are in the struggle know that it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take generations. It's not going to all happen instantaneously. And I think that is the problem that maybe people can get caught up when we want it now, we want it now, but you're not going to get it right away. And Obama, who everyone seems to respect, he is a champion of incremental change. People seem to forget that. Uh, in general, I think I think the loss of a shared sense of objective reality 
a shared set of facts um, is one of the biggest obstacles to overcome, uh, which provides so much space for the plausible deniability as democracy is being dismantled and continues to be dismantled uh, before our eyes. Uh, we can see what's happening in state legislatures across the country at lightning speed right now. Um, this is where I, I fall back on like the Nelson Mandela quote, uh, well, more of an adage or whatever, in terms of truth than reconciliation without, without truth, without being able to have a reckoning by which we can return to a shared set of reality-based observations and facts, a framework by which we actually perceive our world. Uh, and a lot of this is by the segmenting of, you know, the segmenting of news uh, based on, on who's, who's providing the news. But uh, I think it's going to be increasingly difficult to, to uh, make any headway in terms of preserving democracy without people being willing to, and a lot of this specific, is specific to not just conservative white America, but like moderate white America too. Uh, the, the notion that, you know, the, in, the inevitability of the survival of the United States as a democracy. Uh, and in Save It For Later, a lot of the focus of this is on the shared perspective, I think, of Generation X and baby boomers um, from, you know, the end of World War II to 9-11, really having a basic set of assumptions throughout much of white America that, you know, of an assumed baseline of stability uh, for the survival of democracy, period. Uh, that the arc of justice is long, but it bends itself towards justice. Um, so while we're doing that, a lot of it is, you know, just like encouraging people to speak the truth. A lot of, you know, people, it's, I, I'm guilty of this too, you know, like in terms of, it gets really stressful to confront people or even just to like recenter things towards, uh, towards the facts, like, you know, I feel that here in my town, here in my neighborhood right now, in terms of like late era virus deniability and people just kind of like giving up on protections in certain parts of my town and watching, you know, and just like sweating it out and, and, you know, trying not to have it make me feel crazy that I'm following these consistent guidelines. But um, a lot of it is, you know, like it, it's really easy for so much of white America to fall into this idea that the rest of the world is going to wipe your butt. And so you can just keep on doing what you're, what you're doing and it, it'll work out. It'll just work out. And, and so much of that is contingent on the privilege of having things generally just work out. Uh, I think that's probably the, the most uh, concrete application of pushing back to make some kind of a change in our immediate surroundings is trying to get people on the same page with the things that matter that are, you know, scientifically objective. And, you know, we, we can see that a year into the pandemic, that remains a challenge. I am a little bit older th than you and a Mexican American and all sorts of other factors fall into place that, uh, Maybe this, the name Richard Luger is foreign to a lot of people, but that's what I think of, or used to think of when I, I would think of Indiana. I'm so, I feel like I'm more like a, just a, in a lot of ways, like a middle of the road kind of guy. Yeah. And, and Richard Luger was the classic middle of the road kind of guy. What the, what the Republican party used to be, what, what we now, maybe with all his faults, now we look nostalgically. If, if only we had more Richard Lugers, uh, for sure. What, what's your take on that? I mean, that was a Republican Party, the loyal opposition. Well, certainly. I, and I mean, a lot of this, a lot of what you're getting at here, uh, which I don't disagree with, you know, like, I think that's really important to highlight is the fact that we have, we have found ourselves uh, arriving at a point 56 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, uh, you know, and eight years since the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, we have arrived at a point in which it should be accepted 
at this point that the modern Republican Party has attempted to have internal reforms. It is it has issued internal mandates and statements. It's had meetings about the urgency of reaching out and expanding, uh, you know, expanding its potential base. And, and you know, I, I'm not a politics expert, but politically, what happens is, you know, it's it's very logical that you, you know, if your policies are unpopular, you listen to the people in order to win elections and keep your job, you adapt your policies, you adapt to the changing world. Uh, and, and really this is where, especially after the 2012 autopsy of the Republican party, after the 2012 election, uh, they kind of just turned their back on that very common sense uh, baseline approach to American politics. And instead the idea uh, went strictly authoritarian in terms of instead of attracting new voters to win elections, uh, it can be much easier to continue choosing your voters, which is why this isn't even just dog whistling, but this is explicit in print, on camera, at meetings, this is on audio, Republican officials talking about their only path to winning elections is by limiting the number of voters. It is by removing the, the basic participation in society that we enjoy in the United States. Uh, it is at, at its essence, authoritarian politics they've shifted to. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking because, I mean, I come from pretty far to the left, but at the same time, I'm one of those people who feels like, you know, there has to be space for socially and politically conservative people in our country. Uh, it's unrealistic to assume that our ideal should be a society in which those people do not hold some hold rational, sane, socially and politically conservative beliefs and ideas as problematic as some, as many of those may be. Um, and so to me, the heartbreaking thing is instead of making space for the very thing which can actually keep the fiber of democracy together, they have explicitly thrown it out the window and they're really going scorched earth uh, to stop them. Like, this sounds like such an exaggeration, but to stop democracy in its tracks, uh, you know, it's, we're not out of the 45 era. We're, we're going to be in the 45 era for the entirety of the 2020s. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't want to accept that. We all deserve a little breathing space to kind of recenter and like try to get back into our lives. We have real things, real signs of incremental progress to be happy about it. You know, it's hard to feel that happiness and that hope. But at the same time, like there's no time to stop fighting right now. There's no time at all. Well, how true. And the whole idea of us living in a pocket of time, it's we're not, we're not, we're not going to live to see what's going to happen next and, and next and next. And it's going to be like a, a, a series of next before we uh, we feel like, ah, oh, we've really we really arrived. And I think that's what Obama is trying to convey to, to folks. It's it's not going to happen overnight. Of course. Um, I, I, I love the whole visual essay format and it uh, fits right in with what comics do best, uh, uh, con concise, uh, taking complex issues and making them more concise. And you can anthropomorphize your, your children as a way to, to protect them and also to make it more universal. All of these beautiful things that comics can do. And at the same time, with, with, with what I'm calling the visual essay, you can you can go a little bit further, you can expand, add extra layers, which kind of works a little bit against what comics do because comics want to be more concise, but at the same time, they, they, they can open up, they can, it can constrict and expand, wouldn't you agree? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, the, uh, on a narrative level and on a formal level, this is really where comics is another, another avenue in which comics excel. Yeah, the visual essay, uh, allows for so much maneuverability in ideas and presentation of ideas uh, in the same physical space, but really exploiting the ability of the reader to navigate and cross-reference things and to pull 
themselves in and out. Um, yes, I mean, it's like the, the comics essay is something that's really taken a long time to firmly establish itself as having the kinds of power that it does. And I'm, I'm really happy that the last five years, uh, in a lot of ways, thanks to the Nibs prevalence, I, I think that the comics essay has really uh, instituted itself in a very powerful and effective way. And to, to just to close out, I, I, I hear a dog in the background. I hope oh, your yeah. dog's okay. Oh, yeah. She, this is like the highlight <laughs> of her life is like right around the middle of the day when every mail carrier service is showing up up and down the street. This is all she does for like an hour. And she's like, I see you. I see you. I see you too. So yeah, my apologies. Oh, no, no problem. I, I just didn't want to keep you from something that... Uh, oh, no, not at all. Uh, I wanted to maybe just get your thoughts on, on John Lewis and how he probably scratched his chin wondering about social media. What, what might come to mind? Because everybody wants to be a Facebook warrior and you get into these battles and you think you've accomplished something, but you have not accomplished much of anything. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would... Uh... I would put a little bit of a, an exception or a fine tuning on the notion that everyone wants to, like wants to you know, stand up and, and do the fight through social media. I, I think that one reason why it's so toxic is because people don't feel like they, people don't actually want to, very few people do. But I do, I think that there is a pretty heavy impl implied pressure to uh to get in the ring and stand up even with the knowledge that it doesn't really move the needle one way or another and really i mean in my opinion it just contributes to the toxic nature of social media it's like it's doing its job it's stratifying us and it's like it's boiling down and simplifying viewpoints into this this binary um and uh you know, like I, I have so much admiration for people who are unafraid to face again, face off against these assholes and these fascists and these trolls. Um, but it is not for me. Uh, uh, I think that, I don't know, one of the best things that has happened in the last few years of my life was deleting my Facebook account a year and a half ago. Uh, and when I think, I think back, you know, just thinking about like 2014, in 2015, and I think about those moments that we learned about in 2017 and 2018 when investigations into Cambridge Analytica and you know Russian troll farms and 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 disinformation campaigns. You know, we started getting a lot more information from that. Knowing that I interacted with some of those posts, uh, not understanding the ways in which these platforms operated, what the actual value was on the other side, on the other side of the screen, uh, not understanding what was commodified, like the clicks themselves, the comment, the, the text entered into comments themselves, but also that I was just like talking to some, you know, like everybody has probably caught them, has probably unknowingly been engaged in some way with like, you know, some closet white supremacist or a, you know, a weird, you know, like Russian, <laughs> Russian internet troll farm worker somewhere. And just like, you know, it's just, it's shameful. It's always shameful when you realize that like, we were all part of, you know, trying, to, we were, so many of us were part of trying to do the right thing and just getting caught up in what we perceived as something that wasn't ultimately serving a purpose that was going to be our undoing as a society. Well, I, I hope I've, I've done some justice to, to save it for later. Is, is there anything else that, that uh, you'd like to say or, uh, or about, the, about the future? Because you've got RUN that's coming up. Certainly. I mean, really, th this is where, you know, I'm, I, I do a lot of nonfiction comics. Um, I, I generally consider myself to be a fiction cartoonist like my home planet is the graphic novels that i make they're also topical but they operate in a different kind of headspace that's my happy place save it for later is a different kind of creature and 
I, I sort of executed it with the mindset that uh, whenever possible, especially when speaking from my heart and from my wheelhouse and my opinions about the, the rapidly changing society we're living in and my attempts to equip my kids to be able to tackle these increasing challenges, um, whenever possible, I felt like it was important to cast myself as the idiot, cast myself as the reactionary, uh, as the person failing to get the message or the person who was unwittingly becoming the kind of like a, a flip side to the like, you know, sunglasses and bearded uh, driving reactionary who I hate so much. So whenever possible, I tried to use the language of comics to present a very clear picture of my own real time kind of shortcomings as I was struggling to adapt uh, to this, you know, breaking reality in the past five or six years. Uh, so I, it's going to be interesting to see how the book is received. Um, uh, and I don't know, I'm going to kind of feel relieved when it's really out there in the world so that that we can move to the next step of conversation about it. Yeah. Okay, well, well, we'll leave it there. And unless you wanted to say something about run. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that just got announced this morning. So uh, run uh, is basically the follow up to March. And even going back to 2015, when we were working furiously on uh, March book three, um, Andrew and Congressman Lewis and I, and our editor Lee at the time, uh, we had these other parts of John Lewis's life and he wanted to continue the story that would range from mid 1965 all the way to the end of the 60s, really um, documenting a much different tone and narrative direction than what we covered in March, which is basically the transition from direct action to public service. Uh, and the book is, it's definitely, it's darker, it's more personal, it's more tinged with loss um, and a search for meaning. Uh, but even doing March book three, we were having a lot of discussions about where we felt these, th this part of Congressman Lewis's story fit, whether it was March book four, whether it was a new book, whether it was a new series. Uh, and ultimately Congressman Lewis was really siding on I have all, you know, how he would, he would say that I've always considered um, the movement in my opinion to be something that is bookended by the signing of the, by, of the Voting Rights Act. That doesn't mean that the movement actually ended, but in the ways in which we talk about eras within the ongoing movement for equality, justice and peace, particularly with Black America in the rightful place as, as Americans with the, you know, the rights and privileges which are so thoughtlessly accepted and exploited by so much of white America. Um, and so, yeah, ultimately when, when we, we rested on the idea that March is these three books, it does end with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, uh, we need to pay attention to the shift in tone and the shift in substance that goes into this next chapter of Congressman Lewis's life. Um, so Andrew and Congressman Lewis came up with Run as being obviously the new brilliant title to extend the metaphor of March. Um, but uh, I, I was already very booked up with a lot, of, a lot of projects that I had put on hold over the years in order to sort of meet the rising responsibilities and scope of March. Uh, and like those, those bills had come due. I needed to make those books. Um, and I wanted to make those books. Uh, the best book I've ever done was, was one of those projects, Come Again. Um, so Andrew's idea was essentially to have me draw the first 10 pages of the book um, as a sort of a, an aesthetic bridge that would link March to run. Uh, but also, it's important to note that the, those opening 10 pages of Run take place two days after the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And it opens uh, two days after the VRA, John Lewis, you know, uh, 
heads down to Americus, Georgia, and takes part with 12 or 13 other protesters in a nonviolent protest against uh, a segregated church in Americus, Georgia. And across town, uh, importantly, uh, it's showing that the white supremacist power structure was learning from the lessons of the civil rights movement to sort of co-opt some of not only the strategies and the tactics, but some of the some of the aesthetic and some of the lip service. So there's there's a really disturbing sequence where in real time, while John Lewis and a team of protesters are getting arrested for trying to go to church, uh, you know, on the other side of town, there are 700 Klansmen in robes in broad daylight, high noon, going on a nonviolent march through town. But the Grand Wizard, who is sort of prepping them for their march through town, is using the language of the civil rights movement when, uh, with intention, when trying to urge these white supremacists to basically become more camera ready, to get a little slicker, to be able to, to lay the groundwork for plausible deniability uh, in order to be more effective in maintaining white supremacy. And it, it's a really disturbing sequence to read. Um, but it, yeah, we basically wanted to establish that the work never ended for an instant. Uh, the movement never ended for an instant. And so we wanted to highlight that two days after March, we just jump right into the thick of protest again with, with RUN. Okay, well, well, we'll leave it right there. Thanks so very much, Nate, for doing this. You bet, glad to talk to you.